Hello, I'm Tuesday and I write fantasy fiction under the name Mary E. Toomey and I am here tonight to read to you in case you have trouble falling asleep. I am going to have a nice soothing voice tonight. I was going to try and read it like an 80s rocker but I think that tonight we'll just go with soothing and see how that works. Um, so tonight we're going to read chapter 5 of Savage Hearts. If you've missed the first four chapters, they're in different videos for you to check out. But today, we're going to go with chapter 5. Scales and Scars, Santos. Before I start, I already started, but before I really start, I have to tell you that Santos is mute. But when he thinks to himself and tries to talk and, and speaks um, using sign language, in the books, it is in italics, so that you can tell, where did it go? Oh, right there. Yes, it's in italics, so that um, the reader knows when they're looking that, that he's signing. So when that's happening, I'm going to just put my hand up like this, so that you know that he's signing. Scales and scars. I hate this. I hate my curse. I'm scaring her by not speaking. But some things just can't be helped. I know she probably doesn't want me anywhere near her bed, but I lay her on it anyway, making it clear that I'm taking the one nearest the door, and she gets the bed nearer the bathroom. I don't feel well, she admits, now that it's just us. It's a great relief that she's confessing this small bit of obvious news to me. If she can speak candidly about her physical pain, the internal wounds will soon come to light. Then perhaps she'll tell me why the Kalku came after her. Only then will we know what we're dealing with. I pull a chair from the desk in the corner, up to her bedside, and hold her left hand. It's to show solidarity, sure, but it also helps me gauge her pain and her reflexes. Slowly, I turn her wrist, taking note of her features when the pain registers on her face. I lift her elbow an inch, but that's all the movement I'll allow. I touch my stomach, hoping she understands that I'm asking her if her abdomen hurts. No, it's just my shoulder, and my head a little. I take my time prodding her skull to check for lumps or abrasions. There's a tender spot on the back of her head that makes her wince when I lightly touch it. Santos, do you have a medical degree? She's lucid enough to fix me with her bright blue eyes, which is a good thing means her headache will clear eventually. There wasn't a concussion to further damage things. I give her a slow shake of my head, though I know this will only worry her more. I've stitched up hundreds of knife wounds, and none of my patients ever fell to infection. Still, I know how I must look to her. Santos the Savage. Her jaw sets with determination. I should go to a hospital. I realize now I've shut out Rafi too soon. She needs someone who can explain this all to her. Even Cruz would be a better option than me at this point. I hold up my finger and trot to the next room, motioning for Raphael to help me out. She's insisting we take her to a hospital. Explain it to her? Rafi studies the flashing movements of my fingers before slapping me on the shoulder. She needs me, eh? Can't say I'm surprised. I swallow my glower and lead him back to Adelita, who makes an effort to sit up at the company. I hold up my hands to tell her that this isn't the time to move around. Why can't I go to the hospital? I was just stabbed. I'm really trying to not freak out, but you're not giving me much to work with. You can keep me away from the Calcu in the hospital, right? Raphael sits on the edge of her bed like it's no big thing. I wish I had the gumption to be bold and do something like that. Adelita doesn't seem bothered at all to have Rafi in her space. Adelita, Adelita, it's been a long day for you, Linda. Santos is the best healer there is, and he's not going to leave your side until your shoulder's well enough to punch Cruz in the face next time he says something stupid. See this? He lifts up his shirt, I'm positive, just to show off his hard-earned musculature. He takes her finger and puts it on his scar, as if she's blind and needs to feel her way through life. That's from the Kalku. Santos here patched me up, and I'm good as new. See these? 
He turns his back to her and displays several dime-sized scars on the right side of his spine. Those are from a dust-up with the Kalku. Santos dug out every single last piece. Didn't use anesthetic on me, the jerk. You're lucky he likes you. He numbed your shoulder before going to town on that wound of yours. No anesthesia? Rafi laughs like it's all hilarious. Yeah, it was to teach me a lesson since the Kalku only found us because of my mistake. Point is, Santos knows what he's doing. He's better than a hospital. The Kalku can find you in a hospital. Their man stabbed you the second he saw us coming. He wanted to ensure that, if you got away, he'd be able to track you down by checking the hospital. You're hidden here with us. She relaxes into the pillow, and I breathe a little easier. So, this Kalku group. Bad guys, eh? Very bad guys, yes. And you? She asks. Are you a bad guy? It's a simple question, not laced with judgment. She's being kidnapped by us, for lack of a better term. She wants to know who she's dealing with, and how worried she should be. Rafi tilts his head at her, his mouth drawing to the side. I think that's for you to decide. But if you're worried we'll hurt you, I can assure you that we won't. In fact, we haven't done a thing but get you to safety and patch you up. Even if our version of a rescue isn't the same as yours, perhaps it's good enough to get you to stop worrying we're going to turn and attack you. Raphael is bold enough to brush a stray, midnight-colored wave from her forehead and tuck it behind her ear. He's flirting, but he's also testing the trust between them. I watch this with fascination, taking note of how normal people go about this sort of thing. One day, I'll be normal. She allows him to touch her face. She lets him prove to her that he's not going to harm her. Adelita purses her lips. Why did they try to take me? You stood out to them. The question is why. Only you know the answer to that. They take all sorts of people they think are valuable. Trust me when I say that you don't want to know what it's like once they've got you. Pain flickers in Raphael's eyes, and I know he's remembering too much. I'm sure he'll never forget the things the elders promised would fade with age. One day those childhood memories won't haunt him. Of course, she doesn't answer him. That would be too simple. Instead, she bites on her lower lip and I lean in, nearly losing myself to the desire to touch that plump bit of flesh she's gambling our entire mission on. Did they take you? My sharp inhale draws her eyes, but they tether back to Raphael, who looks as if she's just flayed him wide open with her astute observation. Rafi nods slowly, and I think for a moment he's going to leave it at that. No one asks him to talk about it all because everyone in our tribe already understands. They know better than to ask about his time in the caves of the Kalku. But she doesn't. She steps on his well-placed landmine, but she does it with such innocence that Raphael can't be angry. With the way her doe eyes blink at him, I'd be shocked if anyone's raised their voice to her ever. Rafi's reply has a forced steadiness to it. They stole me as a baby, but I was lucky. I was rescued when I was five years old. It could have been much worse for me. Santos wasn't rescued until two or three years ago. He points to his eyes. They started the process of turning me into an imbunche and a shapeshifter, but I was liberated before they could complete the process. So I can half change, but that's it. Still, it's enough to scare anyone who knows anything about our world. She touches her pursed lips, muscling past the knee-jerk denial as she drinks it all in. Can you show me? I want to know what a half-wolf looks like so I can recognize you. I don't think I want to be afraid of you. To his credit, Rafi puts on a casual smile as if the whole thing hasn't wrecked his life. Sure, Linda, but I'm not a wolf. My animal took the form of a dragon, but never came full circle. He steps to the side and draws in the breath I've coached him through. He'd never been able to get this far until I joined them. He only breathed a few sparks on occasion. Still, after two years of working with him, all I've managed to bring out is a man with a forked tail, covered in olive scales with gold tips from head to toe. 
She yelps at the transformation, shirking away with her hand over her mouth. Oh, Raphael, I... This is... I can see fear in her eyes that melts to sadness. Then compassion rises, pushing out the angst of seeing something so foreign. She stumbles through too many half-reactions before finally settling on curiosity. Can I... Would it be okay if I touched your scales? Always the charmer. Rafi tilts his head to the side, like he expects her to want to come nearer, though no woman ever has. I truly don't understand how he's managed to hold on to his cockiness. Everyone in the village is disgusted by us, calling us monsters because we've been genetically altered. As if we somehow don't still have access to our human brains when we've transitioned. Raphael holds out his hand, letting her touch the smallest parts of him, so she doesn't have to come too near. But Adelita is a searcher. With much effort, she sits up and leans forward, away from her fear, and runs her hand up Raphael's forearm all the way to his bicep. Just like how the hairs on a person's arm stand up when they're overexcited, Raphael's scales stiffen, and the golden tips lift up through his shiver. They're so hard, but still flexible, like a strange kind of rubber. Does it hurt? She asks as she slides her finger under one of his scales. Each one is the size of a guitar pick. Raphael's eyes close as a wave of pleasure visibly rocks through him. That feels amazing, all of it. It only hurts if I snap off a scale. What happens if you break one off? Feels like breaking a finger. It grows back eventually, but it's not pleasant. Though she hasn't asked all that many questions, Rafi volunteers information. We heal faster than average, Santos and me. She's encroaching on his body space now, her chest just two inches from his. I'm frozen at the sight debating between wanting to cheer for Raphael's victory and getting a woman to come near and also wanting to shove him away so she pets only me. Raphael shivers when her hand caresses his chest. She retracts her touch, as if only just remembering that he's still a man, not just a half-dragon. Sorry, I probably shouldn't have done that. He sucks in his breath, and the scales vanish, leaving him in his man form. A relaxed grin settles on his features, his shoulders rolled back. Never stop touching me just like that. Do you know how rare it is any woman comes near me or Santos? Because we can mutate like that, the villagers don't want anything to do with us. Unless they need protecting. Then we're pushed to the front lines to take all the hits for them. Put the mutants in danger, right? They're not whole humans, so they don't matter as much. Her hand flies over her heart. That's awful. True hurt bleeds through his words. They call us monsters. Her brows lower in what looks like indignation. Mama used to say that monsters are what you make of them. Rafi jerks his chin at her. If that's true, then what do you make of us? She glances from Rock, from Rafi to me and back again. I think you rescued me. Rafi's smirk draws up on the left side of his face. I knew I liked you, Linda. I don't want him talking about my life. It's private, and she doesn't need to know the details. I sign as much to him, but Adelita's mouth falls open. You're deaf? No doubt she's just now realizing that I haven't spoken a word this entire time. It's amazing how long I can go before people make that connection. I shake my head, but Rafi takes up the mantle and explains for me. I don't want to hear it. The whole story makes me sick to my stomach. Twin brothers taken by the Kalku at Earth. Years later, Cruz and his men show up to liberate the captives, but only manage to free one of the twins. Before I could be freed, I was cursed with silence. As if that's the worst thing you can do to a man. Killing a man's brother, that's the worst thing you can do to him. To keep my twin from being liberated, they murdered him murdered their own slave while I was set free, yet confined to silence. Rafi gives her the cleaned-up version. Santos isn't deaf. He's been cursed. The Kalku are a group of wicked people who deal in curses. Cruz and I rescued Santos, but before we could get him out, they took away his right to speak. Do you know how they do that? 
She shakes her head and then turns her chin to me. It steals the air from my lungs when I see her eyes are wet. One blink, and there they go, a line of emotion bleeding down her cheek. She didn't cry when she was stabbed. She didn't weep when she realized we were politely abducting her. But now she's upset because something bad happened to a man she doesn't even really know. A savage? They took away your voice? I nod once, but that's all I'm capable of. I'm not used to being near so being so near crying women. Being that we're always on the road tracking the Kalku soldiers, I'm not used to being around women, period. I can't I don't like this. I'm torn between wanting to grab her a tissue and needing to bolt out of the room. She reaches her hand toward me in a show of kindness, but her face pulls at the motion she really shouldn't be doing. Just like that, I'm myself again. I may not know how to be around women, but I know how to treat a stab wound. I move over to my bed and yank the sheet from underneath the comforter. I keep my eyes on my knife as I cut several four-inch long strips and fashion them into a sling while Raphael tells her highlights of my sad story. The Kalku's curses take the physical form of an axe. They conjure up a curse, and a golden axe appears in a curse tree somewhere in the world. It's usually engraved with a picture of what the curse will do, too. Once the axe appears in the tree, there it stays. As long as the axe is embedded in the tree, the curse stands. Why don't you just remove the axe? Raphael's lopsided smile is gentle with her logical, if not naive, question. The axe is bound so it can't be removed, except by the person who crafted the curse. We've tried everything on many different curse axes, tied it to our car and it still stayed stuck, tried cutting down the tree itself, but the whole trunk is made more solid by the curse running through it. So for now, we don't know how to free Santos from his curse of muteness, or any of the other cursed people from their afflictions, for that matter. But we don't lose hope. If something can be done, it can be undone as well. That's one of the cardinal rules of magic. Magic, she echoes, as if tasting the word to see if it's laced with poison or some kind of trap. I probably don't have to stand behind her to drape the fabric over her shoulder. But if she looks into my eyes with those tears again, I know I'll bolt out the door. So I hide in plain sight. It's not until Rafi reaches forward and thumbs at one of the droplets that I feel a brand of frustration I'm not sure I've ever entertained. I've never begrudged Raphael anything. Whatever trinket catches his eye, I do my utmost to secure for him. Same goes for Cruz. When they rescued me from enslavement, their missions became mine. Their people, my own. It's the least I can do. I owe them every day of my freedom, and they've never taken advantage of my loyalty. When Raphael brushes Adelita's other cheek with his knuckle, it's all for indulgence. There aren't even any tears there. He glances up at me, standing behind her as I cinch the sling around her arm. He flinches at the sight of me. He recoils and holds up both hands in surrender. It's not until then I realize the coldness of my glare and the curl of my upper lip. I manage to brush the malice off my face before Adelita catches my moment of weakness. I don't know what's gotten into me. Rafi is my family. My adoptive brother. My friend. I shouldn't act like this. Raphael steps back to give the bed a healthy three feet of space. Santos is a good man. You don't have to worry about a thing with him. He was the healer for the Kalku back when he was enslaved. Now that Santos is free, he's chosen what kind of man he wants to be. He's devoted his life to helping Cruz take down the Kalku. She's taking it all in, and I'm worried about how it's tumbling around inside of her. I don't want her to think I'm scary or savage. Evil needs only permission to thrive, she says solemnly. My mama used to say that. It sounds like you three are firm that the evil will be stopped. I like that. When she turns to trap me in her eyeline, I trot to the bathroom to wash my hands. I'm sure it looks like I'm being professional, but really, I'm scared of that look in her eyes. She wears an unbridled care for strangers I'd dismissed as a myth a long time ago. 
one cared that I'd gone missing as a baby. No one came looking for my brother and me. Only Cruz and Rafi came searching. And they hadn't even been looking specifically for me, but for prisoners. When I come out, she's telling Raphael goodnight and staring at me with more purpose this time than worry. She waits until the door closes us in the motel room before she blurts out. Are you and your brother identical twins? Of all the things I think she'll say to me, that one didn't make the list. I give her a simple nod and an inquiring eyebrow. Her tears are wiped clean, but worse than compassion, there's now fear tightening her mouth. She doesn't explain herself, but clears the gap between us shocking me when she lifts her right hand to cover half of my face. She's not hiding my scars from view to be cruel, I don't think. She's too scared for that. She wants to use her left hand, but the sling keeps her from hurting herself. Her touch is... It's heady to be touched by a woman. Any man who thinks otherwise is spoiled by good luck. Women are mostly frightened of either my upbringing or my scars, so they don't come near. I have to remind my heart not to hammer too loudly. My whole body freezes as panic hits my nervous system. Am I supposed to touch her face? Should I lean into the touch? I don't want it to end. Why is she looking at me with such intensity? Is this friendship? Is this what Raphael does with women when he gets them alone in the motel room? Her voice is quiet, but the air is so thick with intensity that the sound is amplified in my ears. Will you sit for a second? I need to see something. I do as she asks, because honestly, aside from requesting to be let go, she's asked for nothing. She's standing before me in a torn and bloodied shirt, but she hasn't even asked for a new one. She fishes the two-inch clip from her hair and holds it between her teeth. I'm sorry, I just... I have to see something. My vertebrae melt in a slow line down my back when she combs her fingernails through the hair on the right side of my head. I can't feign stoicism as my eyes close. I want to savor what it feels like to be touched this way by a woman. Her fingers are silk as they direct the turn of my chin. My body trusts her for no reason other than pure instinct. My eyes flash open at the snap of her clip securing part of my hair back from my face. My hair isn't too long, not as long as my brother's was. Mine only falls to my chin, where Santiago's touched his shoulders. She moves to my right side as if she's seeing a ghost. She steps back and covers her mouth, and I worry I've suddenly done something to frighten her. Santiago? Of all the things I expect her to say, my dead twin brother's name, whom she's never met, stuns my heart into a rapid race. That was chapter five of Savage Hearts, which is book one in the Savage Hearts series. Right now, the ebook is available for free everywhere, and that's Amazon, Google Play, Nook, Kobo, and Barnes and Noble, Smashwords, like all the, all those places. It's for free, so you can try book one if you don't want to wait for the next video. I try to upload at least once a week for you. If you don't want to wait for the next one, you can go ahead and read ahead and see um, how Santos turns out. Thank you for reading with me today. I really enjoyed it. I hope you did too.